Greetings. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Kira Epstein. I'm the program coordinator for the New School at Commonweal. And I'm here today with Brooke Hecht and Catherine Cummings from the Center for Humans and Nature to welcome our host, Christine Lukasavich, and today's guest, Dr. Amy Shawanda. We are really honored to co-present this series with the Center for Humans and Nature as part of their Questions for a Resilient Future series. Our series continues in March with Christine talking with Maori artist, designer, and activist Tanya Rucka on March 1st, and then with author and journalist Wab Kijik Rice on March 29th. So we hope you'll join us for both of those as well. I feel so much gratitude to Christine and to the guests in our series and to the Center for Humans and Nature for their time in helping to put together the series, but also just for all the amazing work they're all doing in the world. And we're grateful that all of you are here to uh, listen to the conversation. And we'll have produced audio and video files available on our websites. You can also find our recordings on the New School's SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify feeds. I always want to take time to thank Ken Adams, who makes this all run from behind the scenes. And with that, I will turn it over to Brooke Hecht, the Executive Director for the Center for Humans and Nature. Brooke, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, the Center for Humans and Nature is so thrilled to be partnering with Commonweal on this event. And as already said, it grows from the center's questions for a resilient future series. In this case, the question, what stories does the land hold? And this is an online series um, that was curated by Christine Lukasavich in her role um, as editorial fellow uh, with the Center for Humans and Nature. I just wanna say, um, that I met Christine through the center's partnership with the Calliopeia Foundation. And I've just been so grateful to you, Christine, for your beautiful partnership um, with the center where she has worked, you have worked, <laughs> you've worked very closely with um, my dear and close colleague, uh, Catherine Kasuf Cummings, who I wanna introduce to all of you. If you don't know Catherine yet, um, among Catherine's many roles uh, with the Center for Humans and Nature is um, she is managing editor of the Questions for Resilient Future series. And um, so again, thank you to our beautiful partners and presenters. And Catherine, I, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Brooke. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. Um, and I just want to say that I'm joining today from the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, which is the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa, as well as um, homelands of the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. And for them, this land is a place of exchange, gathering, and healing. Um, it's also the place where the center is based and um, also known as Chicago. In my work with the Center for the Humans and and nature. I produce Questions for a Resilient Future, as Brooke mentioned, which is part of our digital publication. And the questions exist to nurture a public practice of questions. Um, it's a space for refining our responses to the challenges of our time with humility, with curiosity, and in community. Um, and you'll get a taste of that community today with Amy Shawanda and Christine Lukasavich um, sharing um, with us. If you visit the website, humansandnature.org, um, you can explore many of our questions, but especially I'd encourage you to check out this one that Christine created and Amy contributed to, What Stories Does the Land Hold? Um, the question that's bringing us together today. Um, and so it's my delight to introduce Christine. She is Algonquin and mixed settler ancestry and lives in unceded Algonquin territory next to what is now known as Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. Christine is the owner and executive consultant of Waseya Consulting and Waseya Cultural Tours, 
two small businesses dedicated to reviving and celebrating indigenous ancestral knowledge and culture-based practices through educational opportunities. She's also the co-owner of Algonquin Motors, which is a woman-led motorcycle clothing company honoring the spirit of unceded Algonquin territory. And she is currently writing her thesis to complete her MA in Indigenous Studies at Trent University. Until recently, Christine also served as the executive director of Native Land Digital, the organization behind the website native-land.ca, an Indigenous-led non-for-profit which is dedicated to providing a digital platform for Indigenous peoples to share knowledge about their cultures, territories, and knowledge systems across the world. And in all of her work, Christine focuses on creating spaces for Indigenous peoples to share their knowledges, both in physical and digital spaces, and encouraging the reemergence of ancestral kinship ties. Um, as mentioned, in 2021, she was an editorial fellow with the Center, um, during which time she published What Stories Does the Land Hold? And um, I'm pleased to share that she is also now serving on the Center's editorial advisory board and will continue to shape the publishing work that we do. Um, so I want to toss it over to you, Christine, with thanks for sharing your gifts so generally with all, generously with all of us. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you so much, Kate. Kwayani, Bojo, Christina Dushnakas, Manawaska, Sibi, and Donjaba, Adri Jack and Dodam, and Mama Winani Nishnabi Kwayandao. My name is Christine. I belong to the Crane Clan. I am Madawaskarini Algonquin, um, and I am joining you today from my unceded territory, um, just outside of Algonquin Park in Ontario. And if you if you don't know already, I do encourage you to find out whose land you're on, and the responsibilities that you hold as a person now sharing that land. As you've heard already, um, this event series uh, features eight Indigenous artists, or sorry, I should say the, the, the published part of this series features eight Indigenous authors who've answered the question, what stories does the land hold? Part of the questions for a resilient future series. Um, intentionally, Indigenous authors from around the world were invited in to answer that question to create a really beautiful space to celebrate Indigenous brilliance. The speaker series uh, today with Dr. Amy Shawanda is the first of three events um, centered around that what stories does the land hold question. Um, the next event I do hope that you will join us for is with Tanya Rucka and later on at the end of March with Wapgishik Rice. The question what stories does the land hold is one that I had playing around in my mind for quite a while and it is the question that often inspires me when I'm out on the land itself. Really, what do you think of when you look out over a lake and you see the hills? Do you wonder who's been here? Do you wonder who will be here in the future? And what are their stories? What stories does the land hold and whose stories and how can we hear them? So a couple of years ago, um, I, I started working on this series and it's, it's crazy that it's already this far, far, far along. Um, but I will say this author series is one of the biggest privileges of my life. And to each of those authors, Chimigwich, for trusting me to help to bring your stories into the world. And my gratitude to Brooke and Kate at the Center for Humans and Nature for the invitation to work alongside of you. And also to the new school at Commonweal, particularly Kira, helping to bring this story to life. So this question of what stories does a land hold lives on now through conversations. And I'm so excited to, um, to introduce you to Dr. Amy Shawanda. I was on the copy editing um, team at the Turtle, Turtle Island Journal of Indigenous Health. And Amy's piece was one of the very first uh, pieces that I read. And I was completely blown away. Um, here is this beautiful uh, piece by a brilliant Indigenous researcher that was pushing the boundaries of academia by giving us instructions on how we can actively prioritize Indigenous knowledges by carving out appropriate space to cite our knowledges. Fast forward a year and I began my work on my um, master's degree at Trent University and during an introductory session, um, there was Amy in a Zoom meeting and I introduced myself and Amy and I kept on chatting and we've been chatting ever since. Since meeting Amy, she's become Dr. Amy Shawanda and she's welcomed a little girl into her family. And we've had a chance to work together on this What Stories Does a Land Hold series. 
So it is an honor to introduce Dr. Amy Shawanda. Um, she is an Odawa Kwe from McWemakong on Manitoulin Island. She is a mother, an auntie, a student, and a lifelong learner of Anishinaabe cultural ways and Anishinaabe moon. Her research interests primarily lie within the Anishinaabe thinking, being, doing, and connecting with the land. She has a specific focus on bringing indigenous health knowledge into Western healthcare. Her first publication was with the Turtle Island Journal of Indigenous Health called Bawa Jige, Exploring Dreams as Academic References. She has diverse research interests that include indigenous pedagogies, research methods and methodologies, star knowledge, dream knowledges, history and storytelling. And it is my absolute pleasure, um, after what seems like a long time of planning, to be in this space with my friend Amy. Amy, welcome. Thank you for having me, Christine. It's an absolute honor to be here. So first question, um, Amy, can you tell me a little bit about your doctoral research? Can be just, you know, broad, whatever you'd like to touch on. Um, yeah, absolutely. One of the things, though, the, my original doctoral thesis was not what was published. I um, shared I had some ideas I was carrying over from my master's into my doctoral research. Um, just before the pandemic hit, I switched out because it was health related, health focused. I switched it out and I had a little bit of themes that were being thrown around. I was like, I'm going to do star knowledge. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I was kind of all over the place for like two, three months. And then I kind of switched over to like, I'm going to do Anishinaabe motherhood. I didn't know at the time I was pregnant with my little girl. And that's, I think that was, she was motivating factor in all of this. Um, so I switched it over. And so uh, Anishinaabe Motherhood, uh, the act of resistance by resurging traditional teachings and pedagogies is what I came up with. And it was examining the tensions, challenges, and strengths of Anishinaabe Motherhood. And one of the things I am so happy that came out of my research and so proud to see that there are tons of intergenerational cycle breakers. I know we focus, I know there's a lot of focus on deficit lens or deficit based. Uh, research, but I wanted mine to be strength-based. And I was so proud to see the progress in how far we've come as Indigenous people. And looking at those methodologies, I, um, when the Turtle Island Journal uh, publication on Boajage came out, I talked about methodologies. And then so I really wanted to incorporate that into my doctoral thesis. Um, and I really didn't know John Burroughs was was front and center of that because he was one of the, the, he wrote drawing a law. And it was so, when he said like, Hey, I wrote this thing on dreams. He was like, Oh my God. Yes, he did. And I went back and read his stuff and I was like, yes, he was actually influencing me like eight years prior. And I totally forgot about it. So it just sat there. Um, and then all the way up to Nicole Bell. Um, and I just, I guess I wanted to be part of contributing to the growing scholarship on Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Moen. And, um, all the culture that we have and to be proud of and really bring that front and center. Well, I think you're, you're doing a very good job at, you know, really creating those spaces in academia. Um, and, and with that, Amy, you know, looking at your um, doctoral research and specifically one of your um, more recent publications, the Anishinaabe Research Methodology um, that assists in the act of resistance. And in that you say, um, when Anishinaabe mothers attend ceremonies, that is an act of resistance. When Anishinaabe mothers have babies to strengthen their nations, that is an act of resistance. When those children begin to speak the language, that is an act of resistance. When mothers are out in the fields picking sweetgrass with their children, that is an act of resistance. So our existence as Anishinaabe, as Anishinaabe Kwe, that is resistance. So why is it so important for you to share with the world that we are still here, that we are reconnecting, reclaiming, and reasserting ourselves into those spaces we should have always been? Exactly. We've always been here. And that uh, people tend to talk about us in a past tense. And I catch it quite often. And it's it's really interesting to hear and see. And I feel like it was so timely that this was coming out because not only um we're reclaiming our power as Indigenous women, but also I, I'm i a mom of two boys before my little girl came here. And so one of the things too is like, I wanna help raise strong 
Anishinaabe and Ninewag. And so I was like, they are part of this process. Without my little boys, I wouldn't be, and my young man, I should say, <laughs> I wouldn't be here today with, they made me a mom. And so they've also influenced my work every day. They are inspiring to me. And so every time we engage in cultural practice, it's an act of resistance. And it was really interesting too, in my research, um, a lot of people, a lot of women didn't want to participate because they kept thinking, it was really interesting because they're like, well, I'm not, an, I'm not traditional enough. And I said, well, what does that mean? Can you explain that to me? And so they would say like, well, I don't go to powwows or I don't go to ceremony. And I was like, is that what makes us Anishinaabe? I think, so I asked them like little questions, like, do you give your baby mogs into their first parent? And they're like, yeah. Did you buy them dream catchers? And they're like, yeah. And so I was asking, do you smudge? Do you use sage? Do you use, do you speak a little bit of Anishinaabe? And I was like, that's you reclaiming your culture. Even though when we look at the history, um, I think everybody's just about aware of what happened with colonization, the Indian residential schools that were on this resurgence path. path. And so it was just amazing to see that they weren't defining it as that. So it was just we were having these conversations with with my participants and it was just great to see. And and so when I was thinking about my own, reflecting on my own childhood with my mom and my aunties, my uncles, my sister and my brother, I was like, we've always been resisting colonization in some shape or form. And I remember like picking sweetgrass in the back field at my mom's place. And so I'm like, that's resisting. So I was like, we're doing it in these small ways but they're big like we're passing those traditions down it's really interesting to be living at a point in time when you know not only are we really confronting those generations of colonial impact but then also finding ways where we can sort of rewrite that a bit right where we can go in and where we can reclaim but there are those moments when, you know, we we need to sit with it and realize that we are still practicing those ancestral traditions, even if we might not realize it in those exact moments. And somehow through that blood memory, you know, we're able to carry on those practices, even if in that moment we don't know exactly what we're doing. And for me, thinking of like, you know, cleaning fish with my dad or like, you know, hunting for partridge, whatever it might be, even those small acts they're so substantial and it's so incredible that you're kind of, you're putting this work out into the world, really celebrating those moments and kind of, you know, giving us a bit of that reassurance and that support that, you know, we're, we're doing those good things. We're doing that good work. We're reconnecting. And here we are also providing this information for our next generations too. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things like kind of take mental notes as I'm doing things and being out in the land. Um, one particular memory, like you said, blood memory, and that just sparked a memory for me when um, part of my PhD, we were engaging in basket making. And so it was really interesting because as we were basket weaving, like I was weaving away and somebody had asked me like, is there basket weavers in your family? And I was like, no, I don't think so. And like, I was just weaving away. I was. Um, second one done and finished my basket and someone said like are you sure like there's I had very minimal assistance in creating my basket and I just kind of giggled and I was like I don't know I'm gonna call my mom right now and ask her <laughs> and it turned out like two of my aunties from my my grandma's aunties were basket weavers so I thought that was so neat and that all these memories came back front and center and I was like whoa I didn't even know that was that was a possibility or even knew I had that knowledge in me and just same with the back of my hand drum I have a uh, turtle weaved in the back and no one showed me how to do that I just started weaving a turtle at the back of my hand drum. it's um something I just heard someone saying do we have to do the four wheels in the back and she's like no you don't have to and I was like I'm gonna make a turtle then and so I started weaving a turtle without guidance and and I'm really grateful for my aunties and passing that knowledge down. But I always feel like they're always around us and they're always sharing. They're always inspiring us and they're always protecting us, too, in times of need. And they, you know, that's that's kind of the way I don't know, like it's the way that. 
I don't, it, it's the way that had we been able to talk about this, had our aunt, like had my grandma been able to talk about this, had my aunties been able to talk about this, we, you know, we would have been able to, to know these things and continue to practice these things like basket weaving, right? We're, we're sort of facing that, that moment of interruption, but we do know that um, those who, you know, kind of set this path for us and kind of chose for us to be on this path. And also those, those next ones, right. That we're also looking to, um, they're always with us. We're, we're not really doing anything alone. We're always fully supported. And I think like for me, you know, you're talking about basket weaving for me, it was similar with, you know, one of the first times that I made a birch bark basket, all of a sudden, when you hold those materials in your hand, there's just a different feeling to them, right? It's almost like they they kind of belong to be in your hands and you learning how to do it. And you're like reconnecting with those really old practices that, that run through your family. And so, you know, you had mentioned ancestors and your ancestors always being with you. And with that, I'm going to turn to, um, to your publication with the Turtle Island Journal of Indigenous Health, Bawaji Gay Exploring Dreams as Academic References. Um, to set up your article for us to read, um, you write, my ideas for research are often revealed while sleeping. We as Anishinaabe people are here to reconnect to the spiritual realm through dreams. I will explore how Anishinaabe people utilize dreams and validate Indigenous ways of knowing without feeling shy and to be proud of where we obtain our knowledge. We need to normalize our dreams and visions within our writing. Then you also go on to explain this article blossom from my presentation at the Canadian Indigenous slash Native Studies Association Conference hosted at Trent University. Um, in this article, I tackle the literary gap of dream citation guidelines because the academy has not viewed dreaming as a valid source of knowledge. So knowing that, um, like spoiler alert, because I've read through the article a few times, but you, you know, you talk about being visited by your ancestors and them being the ones who, um, you know, encourage you to do the work that, that you do. So knowing that this is, you know, a piece that you've published that's so, so close to you, so close to your heart and really who you are as a person, but also that this article has helped to open the boundaries of academia to make way for our knowledges. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this article and what inspired you to write it? I feel like it was a long year, like just my whole lifetime of building my examples. Um, since I was a little girl, I was a, I am a vivid dream, a dreamer. And it's funny because I don't predict anybody else's. I just predict my own life path or being reassured I'm on the right path. And so there were um, victories and triumphs along the way and just going through life throughout the entire process. So I can think back to when I was a little girl and I had my first vivid dream and I was like, everybody probably just dreams like this. This is normal. And so I never really questioned it because I talked to my mom about my dreams. I talked to my sister. We just like are vivid dreamers. And so I never really thought about it outside the home not being valid. And so it would, it really opened my eyes though. I would say, um, in my early twenties, when one of my best friends had passed away. And so about a few months later, I had this very vivid dream about her and she was calling me on the telephone and poof, she was there. And, and I was crying away and telling her how I felt about everything, the way everything had happened. And so it was that reconnection. Um, but when I told people about my dream, that I had of her and she passed on a lot, a lot of people, not in my community, but non-Indigenous people would kind of like fluff it off and like, yeah, you're crazy. Like that, that doesn't happen. Um, like you probably just imagine it. You're probably feeling really sad. Maybe I was, maybe that is all true too, part of it. But I was like, no, I feel like that was so real. And when I think back of our teachings, there are many teachings we talk about dreaming. And so that's why I, was reflecting on this and it was funny maybe it was you christine who sent some edits back i don't know <laughs> on the on i got some edits back and one of the thing was like let's talk about um some western ideologies and let's bring that let's talk about that and i said why do we always have to validate our knowledge compared to western knowledges i'm so sick and tired of doing that i don't want to do that so i pushed back and i said no i'm not going to do that 
And it was in that moment, I had the TV on and in the background, this, I don't know, I can't recall what the show was, but the show was like, here are some scientists who dreamt and came up with the math formula, the scientific table and, and all of these things. And I was like, oh, I was like, thank you, creator. I will add that in. Thank you for the example. And so <laughs> that's why I added that because I'm like, I said, haha, here are some people who dreamt too. And here, I'm going to put it in my article and kind of bring in our stories of um, the four hills of life when I was reading um, Basil Johnson, and he was talking about the dreams Chijak uh, had, and he talked about having the dream of four hills of life, and he was so frightened by it, and he sat with an elder, and he shared, and they helped really bring these teachings to the forefront, and so that was so amazing um, to see that come to life, and and I was like, okay, there's a lot going on in my dreams, so how do I sort these out, and so I had to really think about ancestral spiritual because i would think ancestrals from long ago the, or even some of the recent past um from when my friend had passed away but also dreaming of the metaphysical beings um which is so important like those are our ancestors and then i was also thinking how how do i talk about people i haven't met yet so i called them spiritual and because i didn't know how to label them as those uh those future spirits those um, we may not even have known um, or have not met yet and they're just waiting for the right time or that they'll be entering into our lives right and so I also came up with some dream dis descriptors in in that article and I talk about dream conversations because I would have conversations like full-on conversations with people and I'd wake up and I know exactly what I'm supposed to do exactly what what's going to happen or I'd have visitations um, I have a, a lot of visitations with my grandma. Um, it's always reassuring to know when she comes and visit. Uh, and there's dream messages that happen, just something like an imagery will pop up and you're, it just kind of sticks with you. And so then you're left to like, how do I interpret that? I don't know. There's so many meanings that can come from that. And then I also had uh, the dream interpretations where you need to go sit and really sit with someone you trust. And I can't emphasize that more. You can't just sit with anybody and talk about this. It has to be someone you trust. Um, and sometimes I've had dreams where I had daydreams and like I would just be doing dishes and then I'm, vision pops and I'm like, whoa, what was that? Or I'll be sitting in ceremony or participating in ceremony and I'll have like these prophecies or visions and I'm like, whoa, that is so cool. And I hold on to those. Um, and so one of the things too, I kind of want to talk about was uh, in the article is Nick Kinogana, which is all my relations. And all my relations are those out on the land, like the inanimate and the animate, but also the metaphysical of Nanabojo, the Nimkig, the Mishnabij, I'm going to totally screw that up, but it's the serpent, Thabe, the Payasak, and Nibinabe. Um, but also to take that even further, like we have this multi-layered understanding of um, Nikanaganon and also bringing in the conversation of our elder brothers and sisters from the plant kingdom, animal kingdom, the insects, the mountains, to the water and icebergs. There's there's just so much that we need to include. And, and so I was like, I don't know, I'm hoping I can capture all of this, but I also opened it up to other academics. If you want to add to the scholarship, please feel free because... Um, it's such an important conversation to bring our knowledge is because it's always has been oppressed and we're still trying to break through in mainstream bringing this knowledge is not always accepted but i'm also like exploring the ideologies and questions of like does academia even deserve this because even though we talk about it as as indigenous people we know what to be true but this space is not really for us yet um we're, we're slowly breaking down and opening those doors for each other Absolutely. And, you know, in being an Indigenous student at Trent University, and, you know, kind of going through that master's program, so a similar experience to what you have, and really, you know, the whole time going through this degree, I'm questioning myself as to, you know, is this really the place that um, is going to help me best share my knowledge with the world, and particularly my community and those folks within my community um, who might need to you know, might need to hear, I might need to read some of the things that I'm reading or that I'm writing. Um, and so I think, you know, 
the reason why I'm so kind of stuck on this article that you had written is that you really do validate and give space to folks. So Chimi Gwich for, for your work in academia there, Amy, and making sure that we've got space to celebrate our knowledges. Um, and then, you know, a conversation you and I had had um, a few a few days ago, um, you know, was sharing a little bit about that recurring dream that you had, you know, one that took place in what's now known as the Southwest U.S. Um, and you understand these dreams as ancestral memories, even perhaps encouraged by some of the food that you eat. Um, do you want to share a little bit about those thoughts? Yeah, I was actually thinking and reflecting on this for the past few months. And then that's why I had the conversation with you, because I think it's so interesting. Um, I was driving towards, uh, I was on the 401 driving towards Ottawa. And um, I remember looking out to the trees and just really thinking about, oh man, our ancestors used to walk here. This is so cool. But yet I'm driving, I'm going a lot faster than they did. So I'm like looking and I could see the water and I was like I wonder how long it took them to walk there or were they running or were they portaging like what were they doing and so those kind of things were sticking with me and I think like um I had this period in my life I had a recurring dream and it just kept coming and I was like what is going on why why is this constantly being shared with me and it would happen over a span of a few months and so as I am where I am today, I started reflecting, like, could that have been to the food I was eating? And I was thinking about the essay I wrote um, for Na uh, Center of Human and Nature. I was like, is the, could it have been the period of food that was being grown, the nutrients that were being pulled up? And I was like, I wonder if that could have been it, where these ancestral memories were like coming to me and kept coming and coming and sharing the message. And I'm still reflecting on that. I don't have an answer for that yet. Maybe it'll come to me. Um, but I feel like everything we do is so interconnected from the food we eat um, to the land we walk upon. I really, really reflect upon that and always thinking about how interrelated it is. So I could have been eating oranges from down in Florida and, <laughs> and having these memories come back to me. And I was thinking about this and, and it's still sitting with me. And I'm, I'm wanting to kind of turn a little bit now to give folks a bit of a, a sneak peek towards your contribution to the um, What Stories Does the Land Hold series. Um, in case folks haven't read Amy's piece yet, essentially Amy walks us through the ways that we are so interconnected with the world that we're surrounded by down to, you know, the oxygen that we take in and the way that we give back to kind of... Um, the way that we give back and the way that we remain in good relationship with the world. And so, you know, ultimately through Amy's piece, and I know this definitely won't give it justice, but, you know, the foods that we, we eat, um, they're very much part of our ancestors. Um, I don't want to say too much. So I want to give Amy space to talk about this and then also too, for people to, to read her piece. Um, but Amy, you know, diving diving into this, and I'm going to get you to say it. I know my my language isn't quite there. Can you say the title for your um, for your piece? Oh my gosh! If anyone's listening from Manitoulin, I apologies. Kenagwa gego ge jemnedo ga begen da na magiing, and that roughly translates to geographies of of embodiment um, in Anishinaabe and um, and so, Amy, so that I'm not, you know, I don't feel like I could ever give your piece justice, but can you tell me a little bit about your piece, um, even what the piece is about, and then diving a little bit more into the ways that we're so interconnected um, with our ancestors and how that ties into the food that we take into our bodies and what nourishes us? So... I'm going to talk about the piece that inspired me writing this. Um, back in October during the pandemic, I stumbled across this uh, uh, journal article called To the Grave, Autopsy, Settler Structures and Indigenous Counterconduct by DeAndre Smiles, one of my favorite Anishinaabe scholars. Um, he was based in, um, or was based in Minnesota, who's now at UBC, I believe, or UVic. Um, he wrote that paper and I read it and it was talking about 
how museums would come and and look at our at our ancestors and I was like that's so weird like why would they do that <laughs> and so I was going through the article and so many things were going off in my head um and when I sat there reading like okay so now they're digging up our ancestors and now they're bringing their them to museums and things like this so I was like they just disrupted um our burials but they just they disrupted that body that was returning to the earth and I was had me questioning what happens to our bodies when we're buried? What happened to our bodies when we were traditionally buried? Um, my search history was probably very gory during that time period. <laughs> because I was like, what happens to bodies when they decompose? <laughs> um, what minerals are returning back to the earth? And so those were a lot of things I kept asking. And so what happens to it? Where does it go? Why does this happen? Um, and it was such a beautiful process. I know that sounds weird, but I was like, I like how... Um, again, it was during this drive to Ottawa on the 401, and I was looking at these trees, and particularly the pine trees, going towards Kingston. And I remember looking at them, and I was like, "Oh my God! If we cut that tree down, we're cutting down our ancestors, whose like nutrients were absorbed for a Christmas tree." Or I was like, "Or our bodies are returning back to the earth, and we're it's coming back 50, 60, 100 years later, and those are the berries we eat, or whatever's around." the strawberries or being absorbed by the maple trees for the sap for that winter for the syrup and so those were some of the things I, I was like thinking about on this drive and was just thinking about DeAndre's work that he wrote and I was like this is so amazing I was in deep thought and I, I read it over and over and over again his paper and and it kept bringing up these things and I and I got consumed and on this journey of like, what happens to us when we die? And how were we traditionally buried? And depending where you were, there, are, there were multiple ways of being buried and um, being honored and going into ceremony on your final journey. I learned about how there was traditional ways of um, ceremonies and, and the little houses that were being placed and just depend on your territory, depend on the landscape you're in, or sometimes, um, Learning about uh, Barbara Wall had taught me, who I cited in the article about how we would be wrapped in birch bark um, because of the antimicrobial properties and being returned in. And I was like, whoa, that is so deep. And then I found out from another person, like we would often be buried by trees, depending like if we were on a journey and they mark it with a rock. Um, I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> Sounds gory, but I was like, this is so cool. I love how our ancestors did things and how smart they were slash are. Um, they continue to be and passing on that knowledge to us. And so we went through that and going and thinking through this process, um, again, just that drive of looking at the blades of grass, the tall, the tall grass to the trees, and thinking of this time of harvesting, I was like, whoa, we're eating parts of our ancestor and bringing that knowledge and really connecting back to that relationship and being engaging in reciprocity. Um, so there was so much going on <laughs> in that. And I wanted to honor and really talk about death as not the final piece. It's ongoing. And we're still giving back 100 years, 200 years later however long that, however we were buried, um, we contribute back to our, um, our future generations. And I think, you know, those, that understanding that we're, we're part of the world and we're part of this interconnectedness with every more than human being um, that we share these places with. And, you know, ultimately we do engage in that reciprocity in those reciprocal relationships with land, because ultimately at least in, I mean, still still in some ways, depending on how folks are are buried. Um, but you know, ultimately, we give back to the land. We engage in that reciprocity. Um, but you know, reading reading your piece up until now, like you know, hearing you say it with with some of our ancestors' bones being in museums, and even the the materials they're buried with, you know, whether they're buried with tools, whether they're buried with beadwork, whatever they may be buried with. Um, the, they deserve to be going back into that land, right? So even, you know, drawing a little bit more attention to 
the bones of our ancestors that remain in museums and how absolutely vital it is for the repatriation of their remains back to our territories. Um, so, you know, years ago, I had learned that Anishinaabeg burial practices meant that we 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 live with our dead, right? It's it's not they weren't kind of off in a in a cemetery, but rather we even lived in sort of the same physical locations as them. And you go even a little bit further with that, and that you know those those ancestors help to nourish us. Um, they also stick with us in you know i guess you can categorize it as very spiritual ways too they're they're never they never leave us um we buried them our ancestors in certain places and in certain ways um knowing that we keep them with us that they remain with us much like the ways that we're also carrying those future generations too um you begin geographies of embodiment by saying um, the geography has encapsulated the stories, histories, and cultural knowledge from the ground our children dance upon to the berries we eat. The land buries the ancient memories until, until we are ready to dig up the elemental wisdom. I embody my territory's geographies and store blood memories of my ancestors in every shape and form. And then you go on to tell the stories of how we as Anishinaabeg embody the land. Um, in the early days of us working together on what stories does the land hold, um, you know, you had mentioned a little bit that this is something that you had already been working on. Um, can you share a little bit about, you know, kind of what those, so we know who has inspired you in some of the work as well as some of your gory Google, you know, Google searches, um, but then wanting to kind of look to even where we are now, or maybe perhaps even what's changed um, for you in the way that you understand the world once you were able to kind of put this thought and your knowledge and your, and your wisdom on paper. Um, I know for me, geographies of embodiment is certainly a piece of writing that sticks with me and one that I carry very close to my heart. Um, it also helps to guide the ways I understand and interact with the world around me. And really even one of the reasons why I asked that question of what stories does the land hold? Because, you know, looking out, um, looking out at the place that I live by total coincidence, I live in the same place that my grandmother was born in 1935, and now here I am somehow living in the same place. So I can look out at the trees that I share this little plot of land with and know that they also, you know, they they knew my grandmother. They knew my grandmother when she was a girl, when she was just, you know, a little baby in this world. Um, so I'm really wondering, you know, in what ways has, you know, bringing this piece to life and putting it out into the world and kind of being able to reflect on it, in what ways has it helped you to deepen your relationship with those more than human beings or even influence the way that you are um, in relationship with that kind of natural world? It, I was teaching um, Indigenous Environmental Studies and Sciences, and I feel like it was so timely at that point in my life because learning about the scientific. So it was, we were doing this, this teaching on two eyed seeing. And I feel like my entire education has been two eyed seeing. I was born and raised on Manitoulin. My education primarily in Wiki from daycare all the way to high school. And they integrated a lot of um, Anishinaabe culture uh, as well as Western ways of knowing, doing and seeing. And so I feel like I had this two eyed seeing all along and taking each of those with me each grade all the way to where I am now. Um, what was particularly important was that it's kind of always been there. Um, I may have not always used it in the way I should have, but it always stood out to me and it stuck with me. And during the, when I was teaching this course, uh, we were teaching on a topic of trees and and trees die. And then like I was running at the time and I was like running through the forest, especially this park I love. And I would see the fallen trees and I would like run through this um trail of cedar and I just love running through it I'm like taking deep deep breaths <laughs> on my runs and and it was I felt so connected and listening to the water I'd run along the stream and I'd run the entire trail 
And when I come back and sit down and I teach the students, I'd be like, whoa, that was so healing for me. And not only for my physical, but also my mental. And it was just everything in my being and doing at that time was, it was like taking care of those four elements of myself, including that spiritual aspect. And so I feel like I can't separate just one from the other. They're all entangled in some way, like on that run, I'd always think about the trees. And so in that article, um, one of my, I think that's one of the things that really hit home for me. Um, I just, I just really love it. And I just pulled it up because I really want to read this so that listen, listeners can hear it. Um, back then the trees lasted centuries today, their lives do not span as long as they do as they used to due to capitalist resource extraction. We understand that our lungs have an integral relationship with the mitigo, the trees. We exhale and they inhale, we inhale and they exhale. Together we share a sacred, a, sac a sacred breath. Those trees produce the oxygen that fills our lungs. The ancestors have passed on and have given us the ability to continue our future. We are forever intertwined. And so that to me, every time I take a breath, I'm always like, I can feel it. I can, I can't see it, but I can feel it. I can feel my lungs expand. Um, and at the time when I wrote this, I was actually pregnant with my daughter and, um, I was thinking of everything I'm eating, everything I'm, I'm consuming, all of my thoughts that are affecting her. And I want to make sure I'm always in a good, have a good state of mind. So I'm not passing anything down to her. Cause those are one of our teachings too. anything we feel, see, or do she's feeling, seeing, and doing while not doing exactly like because she's just a baby, but you know, that was the concept that's passed down to us. So, um, I know every breath I take, she is absorbing everything and she's growing within. So those are some of the concepts where I was like, this is much bigger than me. I'm so integrated into the land. And like without the trees, if we were to like completely lose all the trees in this moment in time, how hard would it be for us to breathe? Um, and even like during that pandemic, when I think this came out, I was thinking about that and everybody was complaining about the mask and things like that. I'm like, well, it's for us to keep safe and, and things like that. I'm not here to talk about that in particular, but I just felt the connection to land. And again, now that my daughter, when she was breastfeeding, when I was, I was being very mindful of the food that I ate um, because it would be made into milk and it would be, the nutrients would be passed on to her. So like, if you want to look at the large continuum of it, it would be like, I'm eating the foods that my ancestors broke down to now my daughter's having, and perhaps maybe her grandchildren, should she have children. Um, so those are some of the things I was thinking big picture. I'm always like a big picture person <laughs> um, looking at the small picture, what, but what are the bigger implications of, of that? So yeah, that's that was kind of how I was looking at everything, how interconnected we are. And it's just, life is just so much bigger than me, so much bigger than you. We're all just interconnected in some shape or form. I'm thinking, um, you know, understanding that like we're, we're part of land, like there's, there's a reason that we feel better. You know, like, as you said, you might not be able to see it, but when you go outside and you take these, you know, breaths of fresh air and you can feel the air on your skin and you're, I don't know, for me, it's like, I'm able to sort of be the best version of myself um, when I take the time to spend time with with land, with those more than human beings that are on the land and the birds and the trees and so on. Um, you can feel that. Everyone can feel that. You feel better when you're you're outside and you're able to to breathe. Like even look at kids, like kids get so much fresh air and they just pass out, like they're conked out completely, right, from being in that fresh air. Um, and thinking of you, you know, your comment about trees and trees aren't lasting as long due to some of, you know, these reasons, including our, our capitalist society that we live on that treats trees as commodity instead of as relations. Um, a birch bark canoe builder that I work with uh, from time to time, he said to me that um, it's harder and harder to find some of these trees, these birch trees that we've held relationships with for so long. Um, we're not always able to find trees big enough to build the canoes that we need. Often we have to splice pieces together. 
trees aren't lasting as long, particularly birch, even because there's so many toxins that are, you know, in the land. So they're absorbing those toxins, really filtering them out for us. But in turn, they're not lasting as long if they're able to stand either. So really, you know, being conscious and tapping into the fact that we are part of this interconnected circle, that we are we are really meant to be in those active kinship roles with all more than human relations that we have, whether we can see them or not. We hold those responsibilities because we're sharing this place with them as well, too. And so kind of as a human race, we need to we need to be more conscious of that. We need to be more kind and loving to those relations that we don't often pay enough attention to. Um, so knowing that we're kind of, you know, coming up to to about the time when we're going to open up for questions and answers, I've got a few more questions for you, Amy. Um, the next is, you know, I consider myself to be very lucky to be familiar with the work that you do. And, you know, to folks who are listening, letting you on in on a little secret that sometimes when Amy is, you know, working on a piece of writing, she'll send it over to me and kind of just say, hey, what do you think of this? And then I write her, you know, read it and then send a message back going, oh, my goodness, Amy, this is so incredible. You know, <laughs> it's, I feel very <laughs> privileged to be in that role, to be able to read some of Amy's work and just, you know, kind of tap into that that side that folks might not often see until it's at that published side of things. Um, but with that, you know, Amy, I'd love to chat a little bit more about the role that your family plays in inspiring your work. Um who are your mentors and who gently pushes you along and who inspires you? Oh my gosh. I, it's funny because I recently answered this question, um, who are your mentors? And I feel like I've had a lifetime of mentors and I feel like they keep passing the baton to the next person and just to help me grow either in an, an academic way or maybe in a motherhood role or everybody's inspiring me in some shape or form. I, I feel like I can't just name one person as I have a whole community that supports me. Um, and, and who I feel like who keeps me in check, probably my oldest son. <laughs> um, sometimes I'll have conversations with him and he will look at me and he'll be like, no, no, like, no, that's not a good idea. <laughs> or uh, sometimes I'll talk to him and share something. He's like, whoa, you wrote that. I'm like, yeah, is it bad? And he's like, no, like, I didn't know you can produce that. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> and so, and part of inspiration, um, if you read the dream article, Blodge I talk about him since before he was born. And so he was someone who, uh, a spirit that I didn't know. And he came to visit me in a dream. And he said, like, you know, I was living a totally completely lifestyle that I'm living today. Um, and so he's like, okay, mom, I need you to settle down. Uh, we need to get together because I want to come earth side. And so I just kind of dismissed the dream, but I was still really freaked out inside. And to this day, I could still vividly remember his voice in that dream and how he spoke to me with like this gentle, but sternness. And he's like that to this day. He's gentle, but yet so stern. Um, and he was, he would talk to me and saying like, you know, send me these messages. And I was like, okay. I hear you loud and clear. Um, so yeah, so today he's been my biggest inspiration and even to my middle child, to my youngest and just seeing all of them, making sure I'm always walking in good relationships with everybody and really demonstrating the, that for them because um, I am one of their biggest role models in the home, but also like showing them, um, you know, I'm their biggest advocate as well. So when I'm out in public or we're out doing things or even with the schools or interactions that we're doing, I'm always on this. <laughs> it's so funny. I was having this conversation yesterday. I don't like injustice. And when I see injustice, I'll either write about it. Hence my master thesis on smudging ceremonies <laughs> um, to inspiration of like really encouraging others to um, policy briefs that I'm, or policies that I'm writing or assisting or making change. So right now I'm working at University of Toronto with uh, Indigenous child welfare and looking at the policies that impact our families. And so when I carry those stories of, of the families that shared with me what, what, what was their interactions, 
I look at my own family and be like, whoa, that could have just happened to us, you know, just carrying all of these stories around. Um, so again, I feel like my early, early mentors, supporters were my mom, my sisters, my brother, my aunties, my uncle, my aunties, uncles, my cousins, um, inspired me in some shape or form or, you know, had me in check <laughs> in some way along the way. And, um, yeah. And right now my daughter is my little me. And so it's really interesting to watch myself in such a small person and my personality come <laughs> changing through. <laughs> What just popped into my head there is my my grandmother who I'd mentioned before. Um, she told my dad when when she found out that you know my parents were pregnant with me that um, she said, you know, I hope that you either have um, ten boys or one girl who's just like you. And I am so much like my father, and they've only got the one kid. <laughs> So it's it's just really interesting. And then also, you know, I don't have children of my own, but looking at myself, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to like kind of carry on, you know, some of my dad's quirky traits and also some of the, you know, the wonderful traits that he holds too. Um, so, you know, really interesting that you can see yourself coming out in your daughter. Because how old is your daughter now? She's 19 months. Amazing. Um all right. And so with that kind of, you know, one one last question for you, Amy. Um, and, you know, this is one that's sort of baited because I, I know a bit of the answer to this. But what's what's next for you? What will 2023 bring your family and your career? 2023 is going to be a big, exciting year for us here in the Shawanda household. Um not to give too much away because I'm waiting for the big official announcement, but I am moving from U of T onto bigger and better things. Not that I, I do appreciate all the learning and the teachings I got from U of T. Um, my family is supportive of all the decisions they actually encourage. I also always include them in my decision making and anything that I do, um, making sure like how do my decisions impact them and usually consult with them, especially my oldest son, because he's so wise beyond his year. He's just an old spirit and absolutely love him for that. Um, but really having those talks with them. But yeah, stay tuned. You will see more things coming out that are in publication that are being probably going to be out soon, but also where I'm headed next. It's really exciting, folks. So I didn't want to put too much out there for Amy, um, because again, no official announcements out there, but essentially Amy is continuing um, to really shape academia in some really incredible ways. So stay tuned for, for that. Um, so I will, you know, open the, the floor to you, Amy. Is there anything that you would like to add? Anything you'd like to chat about? Any questions you'd like to ask me? Just really anything else you want to add at all? No, but I need to connect because I really want to come up to Algonquin territory since that I, my children are from, uh, registered or not registered, but they have affiliation with Kittigan ZB. So I really want to reconnect with or connect with the Algonquin territory and show them their ancestral lands as well. So yeah, I'm hoping we can connect so we can we can get that going. Yeah, come and visit. Um, so for folks who are you know listening to this conversation, Amy and I live about two and a half hours away from each other. So we're not actually that far away. Though given that you know we've been in this pandemic for a couple of years, we actually have never met in person. Um, so Amy, <laughs> you have an open invitation to come to this part of Algonquin territory anytime. Perfect. Thank you. And so um, with my whole heart, Chi McGuish, thank you so much, Amy, for sharing time with me today, sharing a bit about your work, a bit about your family and about, um, you know, everyone who inspires you. Um, what's up next for, for us is we're going to open up this space to any questions that folks might have. So I ask that you please put them in the, um, in the chat and I will kind of, um, say them to, to Amy and we will go from there. Um, so we've got one question so far from Tori in Berlin, who works at the Natural History Museum. Much um, talk around museums and indigenous ancestors rightly, rightly focuses on human remains and cultural objects. What additional interventions and actions do you want to see from museums that hold these objects um, that in the Western sense are considered of nature, where to many they would be considered ancestors, medicine, etc.? 
So what was the question in a short form? <laughs> so, you know, what, so, so I'm just reading this because I haven't read it yet before. It's, but, a, it's uh, a big loaded question. No, it's, it's like, uh, <laughs> so we're looking at, you know, museums um, holding, you know, indigenous human remains and those cultural objects. Um, essentially, what sort of actions should museums be taking, uh, particularly the, those museums that hold these objects? Um, what what do you want them to do with these these things oh. that are in their collections? Okay, so I don't specialize in this area, but I know traditional territories are on the path of um, reclaiming their ancestors from wampum belts to beadwork to everything else in between. They there are chiefs and and chief and councils, but also traditional councils wanting those back. So I would encourage working with them, but also. A lot of places have Indigenous, um, well, here comes my daughter. A lot of Indigenous uh, curators are out there now, and I would encourage working with them. Or if not, if you don't have one, ask to hire one and bring one in or bring them in on special advisory because they are the ones that know this stuff better than me. So I would highly encourage getting in touch with them. One thing that I might add to that is, um, you know, pay, pay these Indigenous knowledge holders a good wage to do this work, too, because that knowledge that they hold, that is supported by generations of our ancestors. Um, the, the next question we have, um, you know, is I was wondering what are the challenges for you and your family to live in a society that is so focused on individualism, whereas your culture is much more communal? How do you manage to transfer this community to your children? I think just practicing by doing, you know, I'm always traveling back up to Manitoulin every chance I can escape from the city and go back and be there with them. You know, really showing them what where their homelands are. Um, but now I have a responsibility to my younger ones because now they have two territories that they should get to know. Um, so I feel like leading by example is always my best bet. That's my best practice that I do. Um, so I feel like that is that's the way I engage with it and teaching them. I know I don't say this is community. This is what it is. Like you know, I just show them who, what community is, what they do how we belong. And so it's actually pretty funny because my fiance was like, he's like, wow, your community is really big. And I was like, I guess, like, I thought he was talking about Wiki, but really he meant like my community of support that I built over the years. And I was like, oh, I never even thought of it like, like that. So I guess it's just like who I bring along in the journey and with me. And sometimes I cannot talk to individuals for years, but yet like we'll catch up. Like it's like no, no time has never passed. Um, so again, it just, how, how are you building your community that supports you to be the best version of you? And I think that's how we should be approaching everything. Like, how am I engaging with the environment? How am I engaging with individuals? You know, it doesn't just have to be with an individual person, but how are you connecting with, with nature? Absolutely. Chimigush, thank you for that, Amy. Um, this is a question from David. Um, in our own research on the intersections of the more than human world, community-based conversations and landscapes in the Himalayan context, we often talk about how relational knowledge of the more than human world does not fit neatly or integrate within Western knowledge, knowing that it does not need to in order to be valid. So Amy, in your own work challenging the norms of academia, how do you think institutions can shift to accommodate diverse knowledges in research sciences and storytelling? That's a great question. And I actually have a journal article that's in peer review right at this moment that's going to address that. Um, I talk about uh, Nguyen Daganog, which is the Odawa saying for all my relations, whereas in the in the Gwajige, I say the Ojibwe version. But it's talking about that reconnection and building that space and, you know, really bringing in that knowledge into these spaces. I mean, there are tons of writers, like even Robin Wall Kimmerer, who, who talks about this. We have lots of examples that are out there. Um, it's just like bringing in our allies to come and support and bringing that knowledge in. And I will say too, you know, particularly in academia, um, speaking as an Indigenous student, 
in knowing that we have Indigenous faculty, Indigenous profs and staff to support us and our existence um, in that academic world is so crucial. Um, for folks who are looking to create space for Indigenous and diverse peoples, um, whether on a board or in your staff and so on, uh, you need to have more than one of us there. Always make sure that there, there is a community for us um, because this work is a lot to carry quite often. Um, we're often looked at as sort of that um, kind of like that knowledge expert when, you know, much like we've been talking about today, we are simply practicing, I shouldn't say simply, we are in the practice of being Indigenous peoples, creating spaces for our knowledges. Um, not only do you have a responsibility to make space for us, but also a responsibility to create that safe space where we are supported. Um, so I would just add add at least one or two or three or seven additional folks. Um, so we're not in this alone. Um, where are we? Um, okay, so next question. Um, I am wondering if in academic writing you use non-embodied ancestors as knowledge sources, and if you can say anything about the complexities or processes of this, how to meet academic requirements of consent or knowledge or circumvent Western models. Um, do you want me to repeat that one, Amy? Yeah, let's break that down. That was a little bit loaded. There's okay. a lot going on there. <laughs> so in academic writing, um, you use non-embodied ancestors as knowledge sources. So I'm wondering if that, you know, that in your, your dream knowledges and so on, right? Working with those ancestors, working with those more than human beings, um, and then if you can say anything about the complexities or the process of this um, and how to be inclusive of these, you know, these indigenous knowledges that we hold or those those knowledge sources, um, you know, but still meet academic requirements of consent and, you know, and those sorts of things. Yeah, again. I wish my article was out in past peer review, but <laughs> there is um, there is an article I write that talks exactly that I have actually two out right now that are in peer review and just waiting to get over the threshold of that peer review process. And I challenge that. I, I don't mean to challenge Western concepts, but I am doing it and it's not that I'm tasked with it or... I just did it because I'm like, how does this benefit both Western researchers and Indigenous researchers? And how do we push those boundaries to include um, those voices that are not heard? And how do we include knowledges that are still valid and still knowledge, like that knowledge is still used today. So how do we make space for that? So that's where I'm constantly coming into the lens and writing about and one of the things that my uncle Henry had shared with me when I was like maybe six or seven, and he said like, um, like before you go learning about other cultures, make sure you learn everything about Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe. And I was like, that makes perfect sense. So when I started my journey here, I was like I need to learn and then the more I started to learn the more I knew nothing and so I learned more and then that's why I'm a lifelong learner of Anishinaabe people and and the ways we do things because there's always there's Anishinaabe are comprised of so many nations that we all do things differently but the same and I mean like and again that's another teaching in itself like we can all arrive at the same solution even though it's a different way of doing um and they're still valid so that's kind of how the process and things I think of is like, even though it's an alternative way and who put science and Western ways of new, knowing on a pedestal. And so like, I'm constantly asking these questions and asking my students that because I, even I don't have those, all the answers. I just want to contribute to the conversation. Um, and I should ask Amy, so where where might your next publication be coming from just so folks can kind of check in in a few months time actually the two articles i have right now are coming out from the turtle island uh journal of indigenous health i hope <laughs> hopefully soon um but yeah that's where they will both be coming from 
All right. So folks, you can, um, you can check out the Turtle Island Journal of Indigenous Ho Health, which is um, housed out of the University of Toronto. Um, all right. So next question. For those of us living on ancestral lands, what is most important in our care of and relation to the land and its history? Can you repeat that again? For those of us living on ancestral lands, or here, I might I might paraphrase it a little bit. So, for folks who might be new to Indigenous ancestral lands, what are the roles that they can play in taking care of the land um, and really taking care of the land's history too? Oh my gosh, there's so many things that you can do. Like one, know the traditional territory you're on going to Indigenous events, figuring out, like, you're always invited to Indigenous events. If you're not invited, we're not going to tell you. We're not advertising that. <laughs> so it's always open to public. When you see something, come on in, come learn, come join us and be part of the conversation. And always ask, like, how, how, be humble about it and ask, how can I contribute? How can I help, right? There are so many ways. I don't want to say there's one way because it's unique to each place you're situated in so I would look at where you're um coming from again just simple things from like don't litter um be mindful of where you're purchasing things I try to be very mindful of things although I don't engage in cloth diapers because I really like the convenience of disposable diapers <laughs> if I'm being honest um <laughs> uh just things like that like I'm trying to be mindful of my carbon footprint and things like that at the end of the day where am I, where's my food coming from? How, how many miles is it traveling here? How am I engaging in my traditional practices? Like, you know, you can, you can engage in traditional foods, like what we ate in Anishinaabe territory or the Haudenosaunee territory. Um, like, you know, that's, that's bringing in and bringing that economy back in and, and bringing all of those teachings back. Um, and just be a good person, be a good ancestor at the end of the day. Like, you know, how do you want people to be remembering you? And I think that was from Winona Laduke. What kind of ancestor do you want to be at the end of the day? So those are things I often think about. What kind of impression do I want to leave with people and for my children? And am I making them proud at the end of the day? So those are things I think about. about. So I can't give one specific solution as each territory is unique. Absolutely. And I think to to add, you know, very, very slightly to that and to kind of boil it down, it's like, do do what you're doing from the place of a good heart and make sure that you're in good relationship with with everyone around you, human and more than human and so on. Um, now that we're sharing these territories, we all have that responsibility to, you know, engage in sustainable practices wherever possible and so on. And, you know, as Amy has said, there's there's a role that humility plays here also in looking at it like we can't accomplish everything, right? We can't, we kind of got to take it step by step, but be proud of yourself as you are taking those steps and improving and being able to be in good relation and in whichever way, with really whichever way that you can. But the most important thing is actually taking action and actually being, you know, that good relation and being that good ancestor. Um, there is a question from Michael saying, you know, when I, I made a comment about fair compensation, should it be determined by lawyers? No, because myself, you know, in my my own work, like I set my own rates, right? Like, and, and I think there is a standard of practice, um, particularly when it comes to honorarium and engagement with um, with Indigenous knowledge holders and so on. Um, we need to, at the bare minimum, be paid the same amount as you would, you know, anyone else who's a knowledge keeper, if not more. Um, again, we have generations of ancestral knowledge that supports the work that we do. Amy, do you want to add anything to that at all around compensation? Uh, no, I think that one's more of a complex question and probably not in and outside the area of my expertise because there's so many levels that could be spoken about. So I'm just going to refrain from not answering that. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. So just kind of reading through here. Um, there's a question from Bob. How to best nurture a child with an old spirit? I'm thinking of my seven-year-old granddaughter. That's a great question. I feel like each individual is so unique. And I think looking at 
what are their gifts and really nurturing those gifts that they have. You know, I, every child is different as I have three very different children, night and day, I always call them night, day and afternoon. <laughs> and, you know, just look at their gifts and foster them. That's all I, I can say, because I, I feel like they're just so beautifully unique. So we have one more question. Um, how can we bring other ways of knowing to healthcare settings where the Western way is cited for safety reasons, such as evidence-based practice and so on? I think it depends on your particular region. Because I'm sorry, Kayla, I'm not sure where you're from, but there are some places are more I don't want to say the word advanced, but are more engaged in cultural safety trainings, um, whereas other places are far behind and are playing catch up. It just depends on the region. And I think education and so some of my big news coming down the down the way is like working in these healthcare settings, really working with um, Indigenous knowledge is bringing into healthcare spaces. And that's kind of something that I've been passionate about and doing. Um, so I would just look in the area that you're in and see what's where where everybody's at and and really just bring in small cultural training areas and things like that because that starts to make a small difference there's lots of work that needs to be done in healthcare and in education so i feel like the two go hand in hand and so like we are collectively working on it as indigenous scholars and educators and healthcare workers so it's a big movement it's not one by a single person it's like collective happening across Canada and I believe the U.S. Yeah. And um, so Kayla had also, Kayla who had asked the question also mentioned that, um, that Kayla's in Kansas. And something that I would just add to what Amy's already said is, you know, um, Kayla, even on your own, encouraging you to look to some Indigenous folks who are working in that realm of, of healthcare um, and just kind of learning on your own. And then again, making space for Indigenous folks who might be sort of those healthcare navigators or, you know, folks like, like Amy, whose expertise does lie in some of those healthcare settings, or at least in, in areas related to Indigenous health. Um, so I do have a, a question from Brooke um, here. Brooke has uh, said, you know, Amy, do you have any questions for me to turn the tables a little bit? That's a great question. Well, maybe I will let you close it up and take what are the highlights from the conversation today that we can share with everybody. Um, so, you know, and this is because, Amy, we know each other off of this conversation, too. And I think just being able to my highlight today is certainly just being able to share this space with you, to chat with you, to kind of get ready for this with you to be, you know, playing that really small part in supporting the work that you're doing and the brilliance you're bringing to the world. That's that's really the highlight for me. Um, uh, <laughs> so with that, um, she miigwech to you, Amy, for sharing so much today. Um, I am going to toss this back over to uh, to Catherine at the Center for Humans and Nature at this point in time. Thank you. You have both offered us such a beautiful conversation, Amy, Christine. Thank you. Um, in closing our time together, I'm just. Um, and thinking about, you know, so many of the, the treasures that um, you've given us along this, this conversation, this hour and a half we've shared together. Um, but I'm particularly feeling how tenderly um, we can hold the trees, the land, the earth, um, ourselves and each other when we truly understand and remember um, the interconnectedness and the knowledge that you've both shared today. So thank you. Um, for everyone listening, if you haven't yet read their work, of course, um, there are links scattered in the chat. I hope this conversation has served as a spark to go visit some of those pages. Um, you can find Amy and Christine at their web pages and also at humansandnature.org where you can read their essays. Um, and in the, I want to also mention that in the spring, um, as part of our series of questions, 
our 2023 editorial fellows, Kailea Frederick and Kate Viner of the publication Loam, will be producing a question on how do we come together in a changing world. And so if you are a fan of this questions form, um, please follow the Center for Humans and Nature's online um, newsletter, our e-newsletter, or check out our website to see when that launches. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Kira and Commonweal, for making space for us to gather and learn and share in this conversation. Absolutely. And I just want to say, Christine and Amy, um, such a beautiful conversation. It was wonderful to see you two together and to have your voices at the new school. So thank you. Again, we'll have recordings produced of this conversation. If you're on our mailing lists or you follow our feeds on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, you'll be notified when the recordings are posted. And we're going to send an email uh, out to everyone who registered so that uh, you'll get a, a direct link to the, to the recordings as well as uh, some of the resources from the chat. Um, one more reminder to join us March 1st and March 29th for the next conversations in this series. Christine will be with us. And be sure to sign up for those events on our website at tns.commonweal.org. All right. Christine Lukasavich and Dr. Amy Shawanda, thank you for being with us at the New School at Commonweal. We'll see you all next time. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, 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 don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 River is a healer, the river is a sink, the river knows no end. Feels no way.